Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm Jim Ogle, Executive Director of Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to this, an additional site that we are celebrating as part of International Underground Railroad Month. The Underground Railroad Network to Freedom showcases sites throughout our country that have significant and very important part to play in explaining the Underground Railroad. And I'm so excited that within the confines of Freedom's Frontier, we have 22 sites in Kansas and Missouri. And I'm tickled to death today to be able to help you experience one of those sites with Bob Ritchie, Bob Totten, excuse me, from the Ritchie House. How's that for mixing your name uh, and location together, Bob? Thank you very much, Jim. You know, well, you know, it happens all the time where we, we goof up people's names, so it's not a big deal either way. I'm just glad to be here and have the opportunity to talk to all the folks that are interested in the Underground Railroad. This is what, Underground Railroad Month, and has been proclaimed that, I think, by the city of Topeka and also the state of Kansas. I'm the executive director here at the Ritchie House and the Shawnee County Historical Society, and that really means that I get to make all the tours and, and really meet everybody else that's involved in what's going on. So, But the real reason that we're here today has to do with the fact that we are here at the Ritchie House, and I need to get to that slide so that you can see it. Uh, this is located at 1116 Southeast Madison, and uh, you might be saying, well, where's that in Topeka? Well, it's on the east side, and it's about six blocks southeast of the state capital, six or seven blocks, and it's been here since 1856. And the relevance of that is to know that what we're talking about is bleeding Kansas. I need to give a plug, though, for the folks that uh, pay my bills to some extent. We are the Shawnee County Historical Society, and we've been in existence since 1946. And our Board of Trustees have been trying to preserve and promote history of Shawnee County, which there happens to be a lot. The Ritchie House we acquired in 1995 as a gift, a donation from a couple of attorneys here in town. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to have this house because we get to talk about uh, the concern of quest for freedom back in the 1850s, what we concern ourselves with the quest for freedom in 1950s, and it continues throughout our time frame. Topeka, as you might remember and maybe don't know, was founded in 1854 down at uh, First in Kansas. Nine men from the New England Immigrant Society came here, and this is a facsimile of the founder's cabin because unfortunately, quite a uh, so few days after that he founded the city in 1854, December, this cabin burned. Charles Robinson, the first governor of Kansas, uh, Cyrus Holliday, who is the founder of the railroad, Santa Fe Railroad, that is, um, has, uh, was one of the founders. They were basically folks that came from uh, Lawrence. Similar communities like Topeka were founded by the New England Immigrant Society by men from that area, Manhattan being one of them, Topeka was one, and Lawrence. And they were all done in the year of 1854, right after the uh, passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act because many people at that time throughout the state or throughout the nation wanted to make sure either Kansas was going to be a free state or a pro-slavery state. And by popular sovereignty, meaning the electorate, would be able to determine what their future was going to be. Topeka was picked because we were the uh, center of a ferry down at first in Kansas. This is a picture of what we think was a ferry at that time. There were actually three, but this was used as a ferry to jump off and get across the river as part of the uh, Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, and the California Trail. Folks were coming through Topeka since about 1843 on their way to Oregon, or in some cases out to the gold fields in, in California, or for religious freedom in their minds to Utah. So they were coming through Topeka, basically following US 40 through Topeka from Lawrence. Uh, our protagonists in this are John and Mary Jane Ritchie. They came from southeast of Indianapolis, which is about 10 hours down the road on Interstate 70, and they were wanting to come here for several reasons. Uh, John and Mary uh, were abolitionists, but they were also in the construction business. They were also in the, 
the sense uh, they believed against uh, drinking alcohol. They were into real estate back home in Indiana. And so coming to Kansas or coming to Topeka, they were similar to the men that founded, I think, Topeka, Lawrence, and Manhattan. They were hoping that they could buy land for about $2.19 an acre and then sell it back to people who needed it or wanted it at about $7 an acre. So they were here for, for several reasons, and I'm never sure which is more important to them than anything else, but at least in my mind, uh, real estate was quite much important to them at the time. I'm going to get you to this map here. This is northeast Kansas because I think it's interesting to make sure you're aware of the fact that we had people coming through the Missouri River up to north Kansas City, or at least the southern part of the Kansas City, Missouri, and then went on down to Westport and they got their wagons and their supplies and they either went to Gardner Edgerton down here where I'm locating here and they took the Santa Fe Trail out to Santa Fe which had been in existence since 1828 or they took this dotted line on up to North Platte and up to Oregon and then subsequently either to Oregon, California, and Utah. But this is our trail here for those folks that were taking that and, and they were they were outfitted in uh, wagons. Uh, I've, um, my wife and I have talked about to this to some degree is, is um, let me see if I can get that, you know, what would possess you to say to your wife in March of a year and say, hey, honey, we're going we're gonna to go to Oregon. Um, and she's thinking, well, shoot, the, the place I'm living here in Indiana is okay. It's not great, but it's okay. And he sells the aspect that they're going to go to Oregon. And by the way, you get to walk 15 miles a day. Because even though I'm portraying here a wagon, which was not in the 1850s, but later a wagon train, you normally didn't ride in the wagon. You got to walk. And you, again, you weren't like the, the westerns that we see on TV. You were not always in a single line. Sometimes you were three abreast or four abreast because you didn't want to eat the other person's dust. And that was an issue that occurred for many of us or that were on the trail. And of course, the first person in the first wagon, the next day they were at the end of the wagon. This is again a map of where we are. I, I love maps. I hope you folks will pay attention to it to a degree. This is uh, Shawnee County. We are located here where this arrow is. I don't know if you can see that or not. Uh, let me see if I can get that so you can. Um, we're, we're located approximately here. This is the northern route of the Oregon Trail. It went down here to the Kansas River and crossed or the southern route. And you say, well, why did we need two? This is Big Springs, basically where Hardy's is out there on Interstate uh, 70 in the Turnpike. Well, when the water was high, you took the US 40 route and came through Topeka down to first in Kansas and crossed the river. Cost you a dollar, which is about $30 now in our time frame. Or you took the southern route, which came out to 45th in Topeka uh, Urish Road, you, you took I-470 to Urish Road or that area and then on out to Willard because at Willard when the water was low you could cross the river on a uh, on a shelf of rock and you didn't have to pay the dollar. So you saved some money that way. Crossing the river though quite honestly was really a dangerous place for for pioneers to come through. Now this dotted line I need to point out is actually Gage Boulevard for those who know Topeka and this is 45th Street uh, this was an Indian reservation, and Chief Burnett, for those that live in Topeka, know about Burnett's Mound. It's about 1,170 feet here. Uh, he he had his his um, cabin right up there at the um, uh, the corner of uh, the the Indian reservation, so that he could look at the pioneers coming from the east and trade horses, ox, whatever type of animals they had on their way to Oregon. And he became one of the more, uh, well, he was the richest man in, in Shawnee County when he died in 1870. He's buried at 29th in Lincolnshire. But this is what's going on as the Richies are here in the Topeka area. Um, you've got about 200,000 people went through Topeka uh, on their way to somewhere else. Uh, and you could easily find yourself wanting to uh, sell land to those people as they traversed um, the territory like that. This is an overview of our, our 
position. And I, 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 again, I like to show you this because I think it gives you a better understanding. We're located here at 1118 Southeast Madison. This is the interstate highway coming through. Topeka, uh, the cap this is the judicial center and the capital is located off this picture up here. But the Richies <clears throat> basically owned or bought land between this portion here, let me get, um, from up here on down to here. It was about 120 acres, uh, more or less a rectangle. And the key thing about this is that the Richies, as I said, mentioned uh, earlier, they believed in, uh, they didn't think people should drink alcohol. One of their first meetings they came to Topeka, they went to a temperance meeting. They were very fervently believing that the black man should be treated like the white man. Uh, they were into real estate, which I pointed, and then the fourth thing that you might not be aware of, they thought women should have the right to vote. And uh, Mrs. Ritchie and, and uh, other people involved in that movement, including Susan Anthony, they were contemporaries. And Susan Anthony stayed next door at the 1116 Madison and spoke before the legislature in 1867 in her efforts to try to get uh, women's suffrage passed, which, as you know, is uh, now the amendment that was passed by the U.S. government in 1920. Uh, but they came out here to, uh, this land was important to them and this was a place for them to sell. It's a little tighter here, there's the state capitol. The other thing they were involved in with the Central Congregational Church is uh, Lincoln College, which is located at 10th and Jackson, uh, which is located right up here. The Riches gave them land for that. That was Lincoln College. And then later, about five years later, the Riches bought for $3,000 the land that's located where Washburn University is now, 21st in Washburn, and included in that land was land for a black cemetery, which was on the south side of the Shunga Creek. It's still in existence, but it gives you some flavor of here. Um, they lived here. Uh, we don't know where they lived before, but initially when they came out here to Topeka, uh, the Richies lived in a, in a dugout, uh, similar to this one. This one's pictured in Wabunsee County, but they lived in a dugout, a three-sided cave. Uh, as an effort to uh, live until they figured out what their next step was. But this is for nine months, and, and you've got to know that Mrs. Ritchie had two kids, as they were John's too. Uh, one was five, six years old, Hale Thompson, and then Anna, who was about five or six months old. And unfortunately, in October of 1855, she died, um, and I don't know what she died of, but she died, and they were living in this dugout. At the same time that this was about going on in 1856, Mr. Ritchie was building this building down at 6th in Kansas, where the Fidelity State Bank is. It lasted about 12 years before it burned, but the legislature even used it. But while Ritchie is building this building with a couple of other men in Topeka, I can imagine at home Mrs. Ritchie's saying, well, when, when, when are you going to replace this dugout? I'm tired of living in a dugout. Can, I, can, can you get me some other house? And, and he probably said to his workers, what are you doing Friday night or what are you doing Saturday night? Can you come over to my house and build me this house? which is the, the Ritchie house. Notice the stone that was quarried on the property. We believe the bricks probably came from the Gage uh, Brickyard, which is General Gage. He was a brick person. Uh, and uh, we're not sure about all this stuff. You look at the door up here at the top. We know the door uh, led to a bedroom and they had to go outside to get to their upstairs bedroom. There was no interior staircase. And this door was added uh, the door to the south, which I keep thinking you can see it, but this door to the south, which is kind of up, up layered, it was added in the 1870s because this house, after the Richies moved from here, became a construction site. Um, I'm not as technically uh, adept at this as I'd like to be, but and this is another picture of that. But this house has seven rooms, um, and... Um, I think it was built somewhat like a fort because you got to remember back in 1856 when this was being built, we had consternation of all these marauders around the community who were either pro-slavery or anti-slavery. Lecompton was a, a pro-slavery uh, town. Tecumseh was. The Rees Fruit Farm up at uh, 4th uh, K4 and US 40, uh, 24 I should say, 
another pro-slavery area. Indianola, where the Goodyear plant is, was pro-slavery. And then you had the city of Topeka, which was located approximately at 4th and Kansas with a few hundred people. They were free state. So you've had people bothering you either side of the coin, and they were, they were tough people in that sense. In the throes of that, in oh, April of uh, 1856, there was some ruckus that went along, and I think some free state people injured the sheriff of uh, Douglas County, um, and he got mad about it, got a bunch of people together, and he went over to Lawrence in May of 1856 and burned it. Nobody was killed, but the town was sacked. And it infuriated a lot of people. Can you imagine being in Topeka 20 miles away and learning that your, uh, your friendly town of Lawrence was just burned because of their position on slavery? This is the bleeding Kansas era. It incited John Ritchie, it incited John Brown, who was a contemporary of John Ritchie, and Jim Lane, who was a former lieutenant governor of Indiana, and his family ended up running a grocery store over here in 14th in Kansas. They got upset about this and basically went along and marauded, terrorized various places against the pro-slavery people. Mr. Brown ended up going over to Franklin County in Ottawa and killed two or three pro-slavery people that week. Um, Mr. Lane was uh, had a bunch of men, about 400, that he went and terrorized a bunch of people. This made the lieutenant or the um, territorial governor of Kansas, Wilson Shannon, who just happens to be my fifth great uncle a pro-Southern sympathizer to call out the federal troops because President Pierce wanted to make sure law and order was preserved. Uh, and in the process of doing that, he arrested or had a bunch of people arrested, including John Ritchie, who ended up being put in jail over in Lecompton uh, after September of that year for about six or eight months before he was pardoned. This is an early picture of John Brown. So you've got Brown out there, and you've got Jim Lane, you've got Ritchie and other folks that are on behalf of the Free Staters were terrorizing the community. I haven't introduced you to this man, but he's always had his hair kind of like alfalfa. This is Jim Lane. He became a U.S. Senator from Kansas at one point in time. But every picture I see of this man, is, his hair is always kind of walker jobbed. And I think, you know, it takes four or five minutes in those days to get your picture taken. Don't you think he would have combed his hair? He was, as I say, a, a terrorist for the Free Staters. And he, he didn't even know how to play basketball, but he was leader of the Red Legs, and then they morphed into a group you know as the Jayhawks. And although the Jayhawks sometimes fight K-State, they sure don't know how to play football. Uh, but the, the Jayhawks that Mr. Lane was in favor of and led were people like this. And they had been fighting this issue of freedom on their behalf of the, uh, the black man, basically, on the sense of free state since that period of time. The reason we're talking about our place here at the 1116 Southeast Madison is the Underground Railroad. You know, we had three million slaves in the 1850s. I think about 1,500 to 2,000 were, were fugitives, and these are this is a map showing where they went and where they came from. Most of ours came from Southwest Missouri. And face it, if you could move from Southwest Missouri across the line and become in Kansas and be treated better, I think you would make every effort to do that. In Topeka, this was a, we had eight safe houses. This is a one located at 23rd in Pennsylvania. It's not there anymore. My history teacher used to take people down and show them this house because in the basement, John Brown would, uh, along with others, would uh, take care of fugitive slaves before they moved on. And I'm pretty confident that people from this place at 23rd in Pennsylvania were told if they were on their way to freedom, which was up to Canada in most cases, you go down to the Shungananga Creek, you turn right and head north, and you go to the Ritchie House, and somebody will be able to help you there. This house was one of eight. These are located in Topeka. There were five downtown. There were three out in the southeastern portion, 29th in Adams, 27th in Indiana, and then, of course, 23rd in Pennsylvania. And they were put together with others, but there were eight Topeka boys, white men, who worked on this to make sure that this this occurred. Uh, John Bra uh, Ritchie's here, Jim, I believe it's Jim Armstrong were here. But these, this is a picture later on, not at the time that this was happening. But these guys really worked to make sure that uh, Topeka had a safe journey for <coughs> African Americans who were trying to escape. 
In our case, we do not know of anybody staying next door, in other words, that were fugitive slaves. They were basically given food and water. The Richies were very much um, a little paranoid that everybody knew that they were free staters, and so they were watching what was going on. And this is this was the only house here. There were no there were no trees. There were no other buildings. The Capitol hadn't even been built at that point in time, not even under construction. So you're basically out here by yourself. There's a story about Mrs. Ritchie where she's harboring a black man in the house, and 46 white guys come on horseback to get the black man, and she goes out to meet him. She gives the the black man a rifle, and she has a gun of some sort, some type of weapon, and goes to the head honcho of the the leadership of those 46 men and said, if you come any closer, I'll blow your head off. And apparently she, she they believed her because they left without the black man. I, it just points out the Ritchies were tough people. I know John Ritchie had similar situations occur, but of course he was the man and he could talk and, and get away from having any issues there. Later on, after about uh, 10 or 11 years, the Ritchies moved over to where McDonald's is located, the, the water tower here in Topeka, and this is a, their building, and Mr. Ritchie lived there until 1887 when he died. Uh, at that time, you didn't have indoor plumbing, so although it looks like a pretty decent house, they still needed um, other things to make sure it worked well. We're going to go inside the house here. It is seven rooms. We've mentioned that. We're going to just see the first two floors. There's nothing original inside that uh, is from that time frame. We, we, we put things there to kind of give you a semblance of whatever it is. Uh, there, the, there's a front room and a back room on the second floor. The basement is you know, dirt floored and there's three rooms upstairs which <coughs> are basically made into bedrooms. From the 1940s to the 1990s, this was basically a flop house. It was a place for where you could spend $75 a month and, and get a room. Um, the Richies got rid of this property in the 40s, um, mostly because I think nobody else in their family wanted it at the time. Uh, this is another look at the front room. Notice the, the, uh, uh, the walls. I think you should pay attention to that to, to recognize the fact that they're pretty wide. It is, when you go and visit the Ritchie House, which is open between 9 and 1, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, <clears throat> you will notice that it's relatively nice, whether it's hot or cold outside. Not great, but due to the walls being as thick as they are, uh, there is some insulation from it. The, uh, the second room is this one. I, I assume the kitchen was off the back door uh, here, but we're not dead sure. The thing that I, and we put a bed here just to kind of give you some semblance of what other things were available. The thing that I really, and this is a picture outdoors, <clears throat> can you imagine Mrs. Ritchie being here with a kid upstairs at six, seven years old, and a young boy who's about a year, and it's 12 o'clock at night, and, and somebody knocks on her door in the back door. She gets a gun and, and opens the door, and there's a black man or woman on that side, and, and he's quaking in his boots. He's been told that this is a safe place to go, but he's not sure. And he says to her, are you a friend of a friend? That was the code to determine whether they were going to help him. As I say, no black people at the point in time of the fugitive slave time frame, where slaves were worth about $400 a piece, were there ever any knowledge that they stayed in the house. There were some downtown Topeka, but not in this house, because they were really quite fearful that, uh, you know, they were, they were fearful somebody would come along and, and accost them because of that. This is the backyard. We There was a barn. There was a, still a, a spring house. There was a crib back there. We do know where they're located, but we have not uh, reconstructed it. Later in life, they did, uh, I should mention this, <clears throat> this is a second room, and in this room, something really important happened in April of 19, uh, 1860. And what happened there was a deputy U.S. Marshal by the name of Leonard Arms came to town, and he was still upset about Mr. Ritchie's position on slavery at that time. It had more or less died down by April 1860. It pretty much had been defined that Kansas was going to be a free state community. Uh, but he didn't like it, so he'd gotten a gun from someplace in Johnson County, and he came over to arrest John Ritchie and put him in jail. And John said, I'm not going to go to jail. And they got into this house, 
Both of them had their guns drawn, and Mr. Arms says to John Ritchie, I said, well, I guess I won't arrest you. And that's great, and he heads towards the door, but then he says, no, I, I've changed my mind. And as he swung back around, Mr. Ritchie shot and killed Leonard Arms, and he died here on the floor. So you have a deputy U.S. Marshal who was killed by an abolitionist. Unlike our court systems today, within a day, they had a public hearing, and I've read some of the depositions, and they indicate that, yes, Mr. Ritchie shot and killed Leonard Arms, but as it turned out, it was in self-defense, and he was exonerated. And the deputy U.S. Marshal comes to find out he had no writ, he had no judge telling him to go arrest Ritchie, he just did this on his own volition. And the deputy U.S. Marshal, although <clears throat> I don't think he was in the right, he has been honored up at the State House in the Ring of Honor for law enforcement officers who have been killed in the line of duty. By this time, the Ritchies, <clears throat> this is a later picture, we'll pass over that, but as I mentioned earlier, the Ritchies were very strong about uh, voting, at least for women, and in the late Constitution of 1859, which Mr. Ritchie was a um, representative, they passed law which allowed women to vote in city and school board elections, and then we had our first woman uh, <clears throat> mayor in the whole United States in 1887 from a woman in Argonia. Uh, but they were friends with Susan Anthony. Susan Anthony's brother was from uh, Leavenworth, edited a paper there, and Mrs. Ritchie was very strong in the women's movement for suffrage. Again, this is the property that they, they owned. Um, the, the thing that uh, is important to me is that they had a very much big influence on Topeka, not only because of their issues of, of um, <coughs> suffrage and, and um, equal rights for black men, but they also helped set up one of our universities here in town with uh, Washburn. But the key that I always come around from out of the riches of anything else that I've ever heard is they bought and sold land to uh, African Americans. And by doing so, you had African Americans live down near the Brown versus Board of Education site. And I don't think you would have had the neighborhood concept with the African Americans in that area unless the Richies had provided the land for them to do. So the quest for freedom in the 1850s transpired to the 1954 decision of Brown versus Board of Education, which helped a lot of uh, different races uh, based on the fact that we wanted to have um, schooling that was integrated. And Jim, that's about all I have to say about the Ritchie House, more than you probably wanted. Um, sure, I'm sure anybody not who at has it. anything else that they'd like to hear. Um, not at all. In fact, uh, uh, some of the elements of your presentation, the slides, uh, really got my attention uh, based on the effort to try to uh, memorialize other locations even if they're no longer still there, but other locations that can be part of uh, the Underground Railroad Network for Freedom. Now, I want to give our participants today, our attendees, an opportunity to ask you some questions. Uh, we have two ways you can do this. You can type a question into the question and answer box uh, on your computer, or you can raise your hand. Uh, there is a little... Uh, uh, icon that allows you to raise your hand. I'll unmute your microphone if you'd like to turn on your video as well. Uh, we can put you on screen to ask the question of Bob uh, as we unmute your audio. So to get started, let me ask that question I was suggesting, Bob. Um, you had that slide that showed the locations of some of the other safe houses. And to your knowledge, has there ever been any effort to try to memorialize those locations in a way that will allow people to discover them like in say a walking tour or something with a no I, I really have a constitution hall is one of them there and that was a um, from what i understand a central point 444 southeast uh, quincy which 445 is the federal building there isn't any buildings down there so no i don't think so and the there's a, I haven't been up on Rochester Road, but I was told the one up on Rochester had been torn down, I would say, in the last five years. But then I heard last week that it was still there, so I don't know that answer there. 
I'm not familiar with it. I think we're the only underground railroad site presently in Topeka. As you well know, Lawrence, I think, has some. It seems like every community has, well, you've, you're going to even have that later on in your presentations at later the past hours, where people have some connection with the, you know, the, the Underground Railroad. My sister lives in Exeter, New Hampshire, and talks about some site that she, she's heard about. So I think they're really a lot more around than you recognize, and there were a lot more people trying to help this situation out. Excellent. But no, not here in Topeka. Thank you. And, and I've got another question here. Um, given the Ritchie House is so close to the current path of I-70, uh, do you know how like how close it came to being bulldozed as part of all that? No, I really don't. I know that uh, I personally uh, got to walk on the interstate as it was opened, uh, oblivious at the eighth grade level to recognize that the city uh, was opening it at noon, and here I am on the interstate, and all of a sudden a whole bunch of cars are driving by, but it's really 60, 70 yards away, and uh, if I can get back to it, that slide that I had a kiln, I didn't really talk about it, but the where the interstate bridge is, is where the Richies had a kiln, where they were burning limestone for mortar. Uh, it uh, was in the late 1880s, 1890s, and 1900s, and then fell into disrepair. But uh, <clears throat> no, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that it, uh, we're, we're now a lot more historically in mind. Uh, as an example, just to the south, about a half block down at 12th and Madison, are some exposed uh, trolley tracks. And I know when we got the city paved the road here in the last six months, the uh, sunflower paving made sure that they were going to keep those tracks exposed so that we could still talk about how the Vinewood uh, trolley went out to Lake Shawnee in the 1900s, uh, 1880s, 1890s, as part of that. So there's a lot more interest to that. I think in the eight, 1960s, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of areas in Topeka with urban renewal where the law enforcement area is now. They just went ahead and knocked down a bunch of buildings. And we, as Americans in general, have a tendency to do that where we don't pay too much attention to the past uh, with physical structures. You've uh, always had, since the Cox Education Center reopened and the renovations were complete, an active program for school children. Um, uh, many a school bus has made it down that street. How have you been able to adapt telling this story in a way that might be able to uh, be available to teachers and um, uh, those young people who are learning at home? You know, it's really been a struggle. We do have some school groups that are still on our schedule, which surprises me because <coughs> it's, <coughs> pardon me, uh, when my own family with grandsons who are struggling about how to get back to school and online and so forth, uh, we really haven't had as much luck. We've been open since May. We, we closed down for about six weeks and we've had pretty decent travel of people. This last week, people from Washington State and Washington, D.C., and they were really from Australia. They were part of the embassy people or staff from, from Australia. So we've had a pretty good amount of just walk-ins from adults, but kids, um, we, don't, we haven't addressed that very well, uh, seriously. I mean, if, besides going to the website and doing some online look review and so forth, we just have not accomplished that. Um, and it's really the bulk of what I think we need to do and have is having the school kids come. But if you have more than 15 or 20, you're in jeopardy. And, and I do most of those tours outside to make sure that we're not having people cooped up. It's, it's not as good as it should be. Well, we're all dealing with the challenges that are associated with being able to do this sort of thing uh, along the way. And maybe some of these digital programs been made available over YouTube and the like? I think so. Um, you know, we've had good publicity. The Topeka Capital Journal had a comment about the Underground Railroad today in their paper, and, and they had featured a couple of pictures of the Ritchie House, and we've had good coverage for the respective TV stations, and it was good that we had the governor come out and uh, record a, a piece that you were very much involved in. 
to promote the Underground Railroad and, and so forth. Uh, people really don't know that it exists. I have too many of my own friends, including my family, who never had heard of the Ritchie House. And, and my grandparents were six blocks away uh, because it was, it was a tenement house. It was nothing to, to talk about in regards to that. And I really never learned about the Ritchie House until I worked with the, the great-great-grandson of John <coughs> for about 15 years, and he downplayed uh, the Ritchie House, even though he was aware of it, because his dad planted a tree in front of us that's still alive. Uh, this heritage, I mean, it's, it, it, you hear this story all over the place, I'm sure, Jim, where, oh, I didn't know that happened here. Oh, really? Did this have something to do? And, and whether it's the Underground Railroad site or other historical uh, places, it's, it's things that I think we should pay attention to. Most definitely. I, I really appreciate the time you've allowed us to pay attention to the Ritchie House today. Well, thank you. Making yourself available. And uh, so appreciate uh, what you're doing to continue to educate and tell these stories. After all, um, uh, many a young person uh, likes stories such as um, uh, holding off the 45 people on horseback and things like that. I know. That. that story and the story about Mr. Ritchie shooting and killing a deputy U.S. Marshal is about the two major things that they remember. My grandson went through several years before I ended up doing these tours, and he says, oh, yeah, that's where, and that was about the only thing he could remember, but he knew that it was an underground railroad stop. So those are, you know, where you can kind of relate that way, uh, I think is very important. Bob, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you to everybody that uh, participated and watched. Uh, let me... Um share with everyone, uh, if I may. Uh, we have, uh, as part of International Underground Railroad Month, on the Freedom's Frontier app, uh, we have a special tour to help you discover the Underground Railroad sites that are part of the Network to Freedom. Um, you can see that they are scattered not only uh, the two sites in Topeka, the Ritchie House and um, Constitution Hall, that are uh, available to be visited at this time, but also uh, there are several sites in Wabunsee County that are centered around the Mount Mitchell Heritage Prairie, several sites in Lawrence, uh, the Quindaro site uh, in uh, Kansas City, and two not shown on this map, Battle of Island Mound, and the Fort Scotts uh, National Historic Site are all places uh, that are highlighted on the map. Now, one of the things we have with the app is you can collect digital NPS, Underground Railroad Network to Freedom uh, badges by visiting. This happens automatically when you get within the vicinity of the various locations the uh, digital stamp automatically downloads uh, so that you collect them uh, and marks the time and date that you were visiting there. Um, we certainly know a lot of people like to collect passport stamps, collect the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom stamps, which I know you have one of those there as well, Bob, and we'd really to have uh, people have an opportunity to collect these digital stamps that are mentioned in the tour. Um, and this is what one of those stamps, the old Quindaro Museum looks like along the way. Now a reminder, you can get those, you can download the app from either the Apple App Store on any of your mobile devices made by Apple or the Google Play Store for any Android operating system. Uh, uh, the app will work there as well. So we think it's a real opportunity for everyone to enjoy and uh, collect uh, the experiences associated with all of these elements. So we thank you for being a part of this special presentation by Freedom's Frontier. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for other presentations. We'll be making this available via YouTube and other uh, ways uh, in the near future so that these stories of the Underground Railroad and why these sites are so important are not lost to anyone along the way. Thank you for joining us. 
I do appreciate you being with us on this beautiful Sunday and take care.